right, so Representative Cantrell is going to move House File 1805 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the supplemental budget bill. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, that is my motion. So, let's see. Is there an amendment? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, there is. Okay, let's just move the amendment so that we can get the bill in the shape in which you'd like to discuss it. So, Representative Cantrell is moving the A1 amendment. And uh, let's just vote on that one and get it on the bill. So, any discussion to the A1 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion prevails. And Representative Cantrell, to your bill. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for your time today. It's an honor to be able to present House File 1805, um, which, uh, as amended, appropriates uh, $7.5 million um, from the general fund of the commissioner of DHS to provide emergency services grants um, to uh, eligible organizations that provide essential services uh, for unsheltered folks living in Minnesota. Um, as, uh, as we are now moving into uh, one, of, one of our uh, many seasons that are post-winter, I think it's appropriate to, to reflect on um, just how significant the danger is to unsheltered persons during the winter time in Minnesota. Last year, when I was presenting this bill, uh, I think I talked about the family of five who had a, they had a, a, a four or five-year-old child who had to sleep in their vehicle in Burnsville under an overpass because of the lack of sufficient services uh, in the South Metro, but really in the state as a whole. Uh, to imagine to me that in one of the most prosperous states in our country, to imagine living in one of the most prosperous, country, prosperous countries in the world, that, uh, that we have insofar been unable to, uh, I think, focus on with great intent, uh, alleviating in its entirety our unsheltered crisis, to me, I believe is, is uh, something that, that desperately needs our attention, not only during the winter months, but year round. Because if people don't have access to shelter, if they don't have access to housing, if they don't know how to get that first foot in the door, then it's really hard for them to eventually build personal prosperity, to get access to health care, uh, and all these other kind of things that we all know are essential foundational blocks uh, for personal and, and familial prosperity. Um, so just kind of as a, as a, a touching base on, on some of the statistics, um, the unsheltered population statewide in Minnesota has increased about 62% since 2015. And in the Twin Cities alone, um, it has uh, increased about 136% uh, over the last decade. This is, I think, one of the most uh, imminent crises of our time, especially as we approach, you know, a... Um, a precipice of, of public, uh, of a great public health concern, you know, ensuring that uh, we are still providing for, <coughs> supporting and uplifting uh, unsheltered folks in the state of Minnesota is a matter, I think, of human dignity. Uh, so with that, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, I, I thank you so much for the opportunity to, to discuss this today, uh, and I will uh, turn to my testifier. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Thank you so much, Madam Chair and members, uh, Representative Cantrell. Uh, for the record, I am Wendy Underwood, Vice President for Social Justice Advocacy and Engagement at Catholic Charities of St. Paul in <coughs> Minneapolis. Over the last two years, we have experienced a 32% increase in clients seeking services. One in four of those clients is over the age, I apologize, one in five is over the age of 55. Many of you are familiar with our Dorothy Day campus, just blocks from here, where we serve over 1,000 people a day. When our emergency shelter on that campus opened in 2017, we served 280 people every night. Three years later, we are at absolute max capacity at 356 shelter guests a night. We are truly on the front lines of the significant increases in homelessness. The Emergency Services Program is one of the only sources of public funds available to support our critical shelter programs. Last year, thanks to the support from Representative Cantrell and this committee, a one-time infusion of ESP dollars um, uh, passed, and we were able to secure the last beds we needed at our shelter. Until then, our expanded capacity required people to stay on mats. 
I never say sleep. They're, they're staying at that point. We also use the one-time funding for a temporary housing navigator to help with the increased amount of shelter guests. That position ends in June, while the number of people we serve is very unlikely to change. The second half of our campus, known as the Opportunity Center, is where meals are served, health care is provided, and case managers work with homeless clients to find housing and services. This site has also seen exponential growth, is recognized as a shelter program by the state, and is eligible for ESP, but there is no ESP available. Because of the lack of public resources, private funders and Catholic Charities Reserves are doing its very best, funding 95% of this facility. Now, a site providing workforce services, access to health care, and three meals a day would seem like a public service, but it is not publicly funded. The rapid increase in people needing help calls for more resources we cannot fund. We are stretched to the max. Just like hospitals and nursing facilities, shelters must be seen as critical community infrastructure. We must be able to respond to emergency and complex situations just like COVID-19. ESP helps us. It is the only flexible state funding to support shelter operations, ensuring the success, safety, and well-being of our homeless community and our staff. House File 1805 recognizes the statewide need for ESP and does so ongoing so that investments can be smart and long-lasting. Minnesota will not overcome its homeless crisis without increased public funding. I thank you for this opportunity and uh, ask my other testifier. All right. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, we have Commissioner Cascaden on the list. Please come down. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Sheila Kiskaden. I am an Olmstead <coughs> County Commissioner, but I am not here today representing the Olmstead County Board or the Association of Minnesota Counties. I'm really here because of the work that I have been doing in our community around homelessness and housing overall. So I just want to be clear with the chair, especially, that we don't have a county position on this bill. I responded to the invitation from Catholic Charities to be to come and tell you the, the Rochester story about homelessness because Catholic Charities has become a very big ally of our community as we've looked to dealing with our unsheltered homeless. So Rochester, home of the Mayo Clinic, 3 million visitors a year, 150,000 people, the community. And we thought we were doing really well with addressing the, the needs of unsheltered homeless. We had a number of services in place. We have a, 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 the Dorothy Day Shelter. We have an inter, interfaith hospitality network. We have some of our churches who offer meals on a regular basis. The Salvation Army uh, offers kind of a day gatherings place. Our library is welcoming to people who are unsheltered homeless. But about a year ago, we suddenly had a, a different experience. Suddenly we found people sleeping in our skyways, sleeping in the stairwells of the parking ramps. And that is not healthy for them, and that is not healthy for the community. And there was a lot of community concern about that. So, so we began uh, about a year, well, a little over a year ago, saying, what, what, what can we learn? And we worked with uh, the State uh, Office of Homelessness Prevention and we worked with Catholic Social Service, Catholic Charities. We worked with the Salvation Army. And we have uh, engaged a, the uh, Corporation for Supportive Housing to help us do a long-term plan. Our most immediate thing was how would we have some sort of shelter ready for the winter of 2019 to 2020. And the county stepped up and we uh, made a, a facility available that the county owns and did a quarter of a million dollars of remodeling to that facility this summer and fall. That was well after the allocation you made last year was, was already disposed. Now we're looking at what do we need for long, in the long term. We believe that we need navigators who will work with those who are, uh, who are unsheltered in, in our community. We did a survey, a three-day survey, not a point in time, a three-day survey last fall, and identified about 130 individuals who were unsheltered at that point. We've succeeded in getting about 48 of them into housing, because that is our goal. 
Um, learning from, from, from Catholic Charities, our goal is to make, make any unsheltered situation for people temporary, one time, and very brief. And so we've been working very hard to create housing uh, alternatives, to put in place outreach staff, and yet as we do that, as we look to the future, how are we going to have a, are, are we going to have a year-round shelter? That's an open question for us. How are we going to finance the outreach staff that we need? And Catholic Charities of Winona, who came in and is operating that shelter that the county made available without charge, uh, is spending about $25,000 a month to keep that shelter open from, eight, from 9 p.m. till 7 a.m. And that's only started in December and will end at the end of April. So our story is like many communities. We are sort of caught unaware. We thought we were doing okay. But the unsheltered homeless were pretty much invisible to us till they made themselves visible in our, in our skyways and till there were many more of them. So we're having conversations with, with our major medical providers. Do we need a medical respite kind of option? They have been there. They have helped fund Catholic Charities uh, uh, services. But how long and how, how much can we rely on philanthropy alone? And isn't this a public health public concern for the state of Minnesota. And so I'm, we, I'm here today to say I think that uh, due consideration to this request, uh, Representative Cantrell's bill, I uh, hope that you will, you will take active consideration. I know you have tough budget targets, <coughs> but we can't have people in the underpasses, in encampments, in the skyways, in unprotected situations. So. How can we work together, the private sector, with donations, philanthropy, as Catholic Charities has stepped in, and uh, what's the role of government? That's a, it's going to take all three sectors' engagement to really address the needs of our currently uh, unsheltered homeless and to work actively to prevent homelessness. All right. Well, thank you, Commissioner Christine, and I should say that she's my county commissioner. <laughs> and vice versa, so, Madam Chair. And, and I'm her legislator. <laughs> of course, that's how it works. So, and, yeah. and Madam Chair, if yeah, I Ms. Could, Underwood. Oh, thank you. And just in conclusion, I want to recognize, uh, if you can't tell, uh, today is Homeless Day on the Hill, um, led by the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless, of which we are um, a partner. And I just want to thank all of those who came today. There's 850 wow. advocates people living in homelessness and residents of our programs who are here um, to uh, advocate for this important work. So thanks everyone here. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone. And um, yeah, so we're delighted to have you here today, as I mentioned. And you know, you can see that you're making quite a presence here by the very fact that we don't have enough room for you in one room. So it is very, really impressive to see your advocacy, and it really does make a difference when people show up for something that they care about. Thank you. Um, we're going to go to member questions. Representative Moran. Oh, how do you? I didn't know I was going to come. I was going to come so quickly. Um, so I think on this bill, you're asking for seven point five million dollars. Can you talk about why seven point five million dollars, Ms. Underwood? Sure. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Moran. Uh, I can say that uh, a couple of things. Uh, in 2019, uh, when uh, uh, nonprofits and communities applied for ESP, there was just shy of $16 million in requests, and at the time, only $800,000 a year allocated. Um, because of the one-time infusion of $3 million passed at the end of 2019, um, a few more projects were able to be supported. But uh, just a regular snapshot, in uh, March of 2019, the requested needs were at $16 million. The, um, that number, two is also the position of Homes for All. Representative Moran. Thank you, um, uh, Chair, uh, Chair Liebling. So this is an issue that's, like, really, really important to me um, that I have worked on and believe in. And <clears throat> I was just looking through some of the documents that talks about the individuals the unsheltered homeless uh, that has increased by 62 percent. Uh, the unsheltered population has increased by 136 percent in the Twin Cities and greater Minnesota by 32 percent. And it just goes on and on and on. And we know uh, we have invested a lot of money 
in this over several sessions. And quite frankly, not enough to directly impact people's everyday lives to, for the unsheltered. And, um, but this is having like a huge impact, not only individuals, but families. We have families who are living out in their cars. They are families. And the impact of that is that children are being removed from, their, from these families because they are homeless. That's a really big impact. And so, you know, as we look at the unsheltered and look at individuals, which all of this is important, but we find the families, the kids who have been removed from the homes, are turning to youth who are homeless, so we have a very high youth homelessness, which one day, if we don't get this under control, will be adults who are homeless. And so we really need to go upstream and really do some really good uh, really investment. I'm looking at this chart here that talks about the number of organizations <laughs> over time that has been uh, given dollars. And I would say we are nickel and dime in these organizations that really they cannot have an impact. And so if we're going to really make this a crisis that it is, um, we want to do some real investment, you know, because a lot of times we're investing money in structural pieces and asking for affordable housing that is unaffordable. And, you know, I don't really know what's happening to that $500 million that we are investing when we could be touching like real people's lives and doing the work that, with that Catholic Charities and so many other people are doing. Uh, but we are in a crisis, and, you know, 7.5 is a gentle ax, but it needs to be so much more than that. <coughs> and so I'm hoping that we have some folks around the table come forth that uh, is a part of Coalition for, for Homeless, Co Coalition for Homelessness to really speak on the behalf of all the families that we are seeing that are uh, sleeping in their cars, whole families that are in tents whole families that are having their kids removed from their homes and put into uh, care because their families are not making enough money, cannot afford the rent, um, and it's really creating a crisis, not only here in the Twin Cities, but across the state of Minnesota. So, you know, you talk, uh, Wendy, is there anything that you can see Catholic Charity doing around family homelessness? Sure. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Moran. Uh, thank you so much for your words, and you are exactly right. Mm -hmm. I sadly want to share that a, a program we run in South Minneapolis um, called Hope Street for Youth, uh, in 2019, we turned away over 1,000 youth um, over, like, if you add up all the nights um, where we just didn't have enough um, rooms uh, to stay in, we turned away over 1,000 youth. Um, we do run um, a, uh, we run one family program in um, the Minneapolis-St. Paul area that is able to um, uh, house 42 smaller families and we're able to join the units um, for larger families. Um, that again is shelter and uh, you'll see on the, on the handout with the numbers, um, you can see then again how much um, um, the need is there and the um, the balance of um, public and private support. Uh, but, uh, and there's definitely, there's wonderful programs that, that do focus on families. Catholic Charities of St. Paul in Minneapolis has historically um, focused on single adults. Okay. Thank you. But thank you, Chair Liebner. And, and, and saying all that, just want to say thank you all for your advocacy, for showing up, and for uh, Representative Cantrell for carrying this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to ask if there's anyone else who wanted to testify on this bill. All right, not seeing anyone. Are there other questions from members? Representative Bierman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to everybody here coming up to the Capitol. I had a number of you in my office today and we had a nice conversation. This issue is pervasive across the state and it's affecting every single committee that all of the legislators sit on and so I think it's it's a it's a really complex issue you know we, we had a meeting last night on ed policy about mental health of our children in schools and homelessness plays a role into that and health care which you've mentioned and Housing, of course, in housing finance, that's what we talk about, is this issue. We need all of these supports of housing, health care, and education, mm -hmm. which to me, it seems like when we have a homeless shelter in my community, 
that next step of the social services, the wraparound, helping the, the, the folks get their feet back on the ground and having that stability of housing is critical. But since it's such a complex issue and there's so many various organizations and streams of funding from the state and for this group or that group, what would you, Ms. Underwood, recommend as sort of the next essential critical steps that we as a legislature could do other than obviously definitely this financial support, which, which is a clear need to start? Oh, small question, Ms. Underwood. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Madam <clears throat> Chair and uh, Representative Bierman. Um, I really appreciate you um, uh, calling out the connectivity that is happening um, around the legislature and across our state agencies. Um, I am grateful for that. Uh, we've been working really hard chipping away at educating members and community on, on what is happening to the best of our ability to be able to understand it ourselves. And so um, to have it be a prominent issue um, this session in the last uh, couple of years has been great. Um, and uh, I will say, um, you know, there's, there's a lot to your question. And um, what I really recognize is how we are just clinging on to the tipping point. We are clinging. Um, and the, uh, the one-time funding last year that Representative Moran mentioned in your, in your handouts, I want to reiterate that was one time, um, helped um, save a few more people, helped a few more people get through a few more months. Um, you may recall uh, there was a, um, a large, a $5 million private investment earlier this winter to help house um, more people temporarily, um, just like Commissioner Cascaden's story. And so I would say um, it's, it's a commitment to recognizing um, the need longer term that ends in housing. Um, um, all of this, um, we believe, start, starts and ends with housing. And while there's a lot of effort to, to build more, to recognize naturally affordable occurring, to be able to support more people at different um, income levels and different needs, that we also have to keep up what is, what is the safety net, I mean, what is the base. Uh, so I, I guess to answer your question is we all, we all have to do a lot at once right now um, to not crash over that tipping point. Madam Chair, Ms. Underwood, thank you very much um, for that response. I, I guess I want to leave a little bit of hope here. Uh, we were talking in my office earlier in the day about the fact that here in Minnesota, we have solved the homeless crisis before. Decades ago, it was a private public partnership and we got the job done. So I think with the folks in this room and the, the multitude of charities that can help in some small way and the market forces we're trying to unleash in housing and finance and the members around this table who will hopefully pass this bill out today. We can work on this issue and keep our eye on the prize. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you, Representative uh, Cantrell, for bringing this bill forward. Obviously, homelessness is a crisis that affects uh, a greater number of people, and it's just uh, very disheartening to me to see families that are in a homeless situation. Um, just a couple questions. You know, last year, uh, I think we put three million over two years into emergency services in 2019. And then a one-time funding of 1.7 million. Now I notice there's a long list of organizations, and in fact, according to my notes I have here, there's over 200 organizations in Minnesota working to create housing stability for all Minnesotans. Is there any? And I guess my question would be for uh, Miss Underwood: Is there any coordination between those 200 organizations in terms of meeting the need, or are they all working separately, or how does that work? Ms. Underwood. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Grunhagen, thank you. I want to uh, recognize the, um, the ESP program right now is 1.7 million over the biennium, and then last year there was a one-time infusion of $3 million to be spent the first year of the biennium because of our uh, emergency needs last year. So, so thank you for recognizing those numbers. Um, I would say two things. Um, the coordination of those different groups is right here in this room, uh, for sure. The Coalition for the Homeless is made up of, I think, 160 different organizations. And, um, and within that, also that number of, of 200 different groups, 
uh, you know, it can really depend. Um, we are unique, <clears throat> Catholic Charities of St. Paul and Minneapolis, in how large we are. We are the largest um, uh, provider in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, but we are um, providing um, ex we are providing the exact same thing as what is happening around the state in um, in Bemidji or in uh, Rochester or in um, very small communities uh, that uh, need uh, shelter. They need um, so, you know, case managers to help a person navigate our really complex system to receive services um, and to lead to housing. So, um, and then there are um, a lot of advocates to um, uh, supporting these issues. So across our, our great beautiful state, our 87 counties, um, there are all shapes and sizes of groups um, serving where they can with what they have. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I guess I'd like to recognize Governor Walz's effort, too. I know he raised about $5 million according to published reports to try to address homelessness, so he should be commended for that also. Um, the, you know, the other thing I have is here in Minnesota, we have several different housing services and grants to administer this, and according to the Minnesota Department of Human Services here, with that... 3 million last year and 1.7 million appropriated, we were able to fund six new agencies. I just don't know why, you know, DHS has over almost 7,000 employees. I don't know why we need six new agencies to administer this. And you know, the testimony from Mr. Un Ms. Underwood just got saying it's complex to receive this money. <coughs> to me, you know, I think we should look at consolidating some of this stuff and making it easier for the, the organizations that are trying to help these people access the money that they need and get as much of that money actually getting to the people that need it uh, versus, uh, and maybe I'm not understanding this, but creating six new agencies doesn't strike me as simplifying things. It strikes me as complicating things. Representative Any? Grunhagen, maybe we could have Mr. Berg speak to that. Would that be okay? okay? Sure. All right, Mr. Berg. Madam Chair, Representative Grunhagen, when it makes reference to six new agencies here, they're talking about homeless services agencies. Those are that is not state government agencies. Those are six new entities which are providing homeless services like Catholic Char Charities. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thanks for that comment, Mr. Berg. So, Mr. Berg, from your perspective, could we simplify this process a little bit more so that these organizations can actually get the money they need uh, quicker and more efficiently to meet the needs of the people who actually need it? Or, is, or are we operating in government as, as efficiently as possible here? So, uh, Representative Grunhagen, I don't know if that's really a question. for You're asking Mr. Berg to kind of do our work for us. Um, well, I think Chair, that, he but, seems to know a lot. well, he does, he does. <laughs> his credibility depends on his staying out of the fray sometimes. Okay. <laughs> but I, I, what I would say, what I would say is, um, I think it's a very good question. Thank you. And, um, I think it's a, you know, something that we should definitely think about. And I would actually think that, uh, DHS might be more appropriate to ask, maybe not now, but, um, you know, I, I, I think it's a very good question about whether we are um, delivering the services as efficiently as we might. But I do want to point out, this is not government mostly. I mean, we're making grants to private organizations, nonprofits, but private organizations who are determining how to do this. And, uh, but Madam you know, Chair, they have to fill out forms to apply for that money, right? Well, I, I assume they do, Representative Grunhagen, and you know what? We wouldn't want it any other way because when we hand out money to entities, right. we certainly want to make sure that we understand where the money's going and that it's going to be well used and we try to, I mean, on this committee, we're yep. constantly trying to find the right balance of that right. How do we make sure money goes where we want it to go and nowhere else? And how do we also not stop it from going to do the things we want it to do? So there, I think there's a lot to unpack here. Yep. And I appreciate your raising that issue. And um, the bill is going to be laid over today. There's certainly more time to talk about that. And um, I, I think maybe Ms. Underwood would even maybe meet with you to talk about it if, yeah. you know, or, okay. you know, and thank you for bringing that up. Are there other questions from members? All right, seeing none, 
Um, the bill will be laid over. Let's see, we are talking about House File 1805. Now, Representative Cantrell, did you want to say anything? Oh, uh, just uh, very briefly, Madam Chair, I do appreciate um, you taking the time to, to hear this bill in, in our committee. Um, that, I know that means a lot to myself uh, and to all the advocates who are here today and to all the advocates who, who weren't able to be here today because they're they're struggling in real time with the uh, issues of unshelteredness. So I just wanted to thank you again, Madam Chair, for um, hearing this in your committee. I appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Cantrell. So the bill will, uh, House File 1805, will be laid over for possible inclusion in the supplemental budget bill.